And uh, I'll, I'll put this quiz to you because I'm very famous for my uh, walking tour I give of campus, and a few grad students may have been on it, where we examine the 12,000 year human history of this place we're in right now. That humans have lived on this lake shore for 12,000 years. And in particular, a very robust period of time from 2,500 years ago to 700 years ago, uh, this effigy mount society, um, we're in the ge geographic and cultural center of that society. And as such, we now consider the most archaeologically rich campus of any in the United States, because we're right on top of this uh, pretty amazing effigy mount society here. Um, so my tour is just kind of examines how we understand that today and how students have reconciled uh, the indigenous presence here in the Great Lakes over time. So welcome, Poso, Anin, Sigoli, Yate, hello, and some of the language of the indigenous peoples of our hemisphere, right? I always call it hemisphere, sweet hemisphere. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I start with this drawing. It's pretty interesting. Here we have an incredible document that is actually from 1849, and it is some of the Fond du Lac, the Red Cliff, the Bad River, the Lacoudere, uh, the St. Croix Ojibwe nations are going back to Washington, D.C. to renegotiate an 1842 treaty ceding land here in the Western Great Lakes. And they're trying to talk to President Fillmore. And so we can see they're of the same uh, eyes and hearts. They're, they have the same perspective. We can see how united the, the representational figures are. And that out of the crane, out of Chief Buffalo, but represented by the Crane Clan, his eye is heading out to the, to the left, or to the right, I'm sorry, stage right. Um, and, and that is saying, I'm going to communicate with our civic leadership of the United States. We are all on the same page, and Chief Buffalo is speaking for us to President Fillmore as we try to figure out, OK, this treaty needs some adjustment. And what they're talking about is we see this line connecting to these four little lakes in the lower left-hand corner. And these are rice lakes. These are where they tend to uh, wild rice, which is a very central part of their way of being. And the big blue line is actually Lake Superior. And so we can kind of see they're talking about, okay, we're in the Great Lakes, the little pathways leading us to our wild rice home. And, and this is what we need to rediscuss uh, as we think about our relationship going forward. And so I think this is a powerful reminder of the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes and the notion of treaty making, of sovereign nations, of leadership and issues that they faced over time as, as new people have come into the Great Lakes. So I just wanted to show that photo uh, to, to start us off. I should... So I actually have a quiz for all of us, but um, how many people are from Wisconsin? So we got a, a little chunk of How many went to Wisconsin public schools? I say, you'll be our insiders. You guys will be all hooked up. This quiz, you're going to kill it. You're just going to knock it out. It's going to be awesome. And those are our guests who might not be from Wisconsin, might struggle a little bit on this information. But as a table, you will collectively use your, your knowledge together to see if we can uh, fill in our little quiz. So if I can help get help spending these out a little bit. So you have, we'll give you uh, about seven minutes or so to try to, you can pass them back there, to see if we can fill in the blanks. Just, just worry about the blanks. Don't worry about it, other parts. All right, pens down. Blue books to the front, please. Uh, all right, um, so how'd that go? Everybody, everybody feeling like they're killing, they're knowing the knowledge? Um, what you've just taken, although I you know, didn't give you nearly enough time, we'd have, actually have a class period to take this, right? This is a seventh grade exam offered in the Dells, Wisconsin Dells School District, um, by Priscilla Cleveland, a teacher in the Wisconsin Dells. So you would have taken a week-long unit leading into this, right, if you were a student in seventh grade. And, and this would kind of cover some of what Act 31 is all about here today. And so I just wanted to give us a feel for some of the knowledge that students are learning in Wisconsin public schools around Act 31. And so my colleague's going to help pass out a little pamphlet about what Act 31 is. Before I go too far, does anybody here know what Act 31 is? Can you, is anybody tell us what Act 31 might be? It's, a, it's actually a nickname. It's a, it's a little nickname for something. No? Nobody? Act 31? We, we have an insider from, well, who can maybe, what, what, you want to give a shot? Um, 
That's right. Um, so is anybody here from educational policy studies? Any ed policy types, right? Does educational policy just drop out of the sky? Just like suddenly out of nowhere, massive policy just falls out of the sky. We're like, all right, it's here. Wonderful. Manna from heaven. We had no idea, right? You know, educational policies happen for pretty specific reasons, right? There is some societal need or societal issue or there's something going on that's going to force a pretty sincere thinking about, okay, what do we need in education today? What are our expectations for teachers? What knowledge do students need to know uh, for us to be as productive a society as we hope we are? So you have a little overview of Act 31, and it has some statutory requirements. But I'm going to show you a little video real quick that's going to take us to a resource we're building here in the school. Should that work? There we go. So with Dean Underwood's support and, and the incredible staff at Merit, uh, our media, educational resources, and information technology uh, staff, Merit and Teacher Education Building, they are awesome. If you ever need any help, Merit is just an incredible staff. Um, they'll refine you because you guys are the talent. We are so happy you're here with our school. And Act 31 is a community effort that needs everyone. Kinesiology has Dan Tim, somebody who really understands Act 31 at some of the highest levels we have. We have art professors. We have incredible elementary ed and secondary ed, special ed teachers who have shown a sincere commitment to Act 31. And so we hope you can learn about Act 31 yourselves and incorporate it into your practice. Because as the dean mentioned, the quality of our school, a lot of that comes from your excellence. You guys are here because you are among the best. And we are so excited for you to refine your talents, to develop your research, and hopefully have a little investment in Act 31 as you go forward. So let's take a look at a little why Act 31. I'm not going to repeat this, but. We believe that we are looking to the seven generations of those unborn, we're keeping this land for them. We're keeping this river for them. We're keeping the language, we're keeping the culture. We're keeping the concept of being Menominee people, sovereign nation. That's who we are as Menominee people. And that's who we'll be into the future. Act 31 is an exciting opening to exploring our shared future as Indians and non-Indians here in Wisconsin. We went way back it's in our own plane as being the most archeologically rich campus in the world. It says the people who moved into the Western Great Lakes when the ice receded were the first inhabitants of the new world. So that's a pretty exciting story to think about, of when we think of the Western Great Lakes and the 11 federally recognized Indian nations of Wisconsin. And then we think about the deep human story of when people first started calling the Western Great Lakes home. One thing I think about Native nations is that there is such a strong adherence to tradition and a sense of traditional identity, cultural identity, cultural practice, and cultural ways because people have been in place for so long. These tribal identities are so tied to place that if you're still in that place, why would you ever move away from those ideas and those spiritualities and those worldviews that define you, that yourself and your ancestors. And so I think despite the United States' best efforts to have Native peoples transform away from those tribal identities, their linguistic heritage, that connection to place and the sense that our ancestors have lived and breathed in this place for so long and that their connection to place shaped who we are. It's our connection to our ancestors that keep us attached to the worldviews and the cultural heritage of this place. Act 31 is an invitation to get to know the deep human story of the Western Great Lakes. It helps us understand our neighbors. It helps us understand our own shared history and the complicated human relations of the Great Lakes. That this place has been a contested place for the entirety of its human story. Take it easy. Act 31 was born out of a pretty difficult period of misunderstanding. And it's amazing how misunderstanding can lead to such incredible conflict that spread across the entirety of the northern part of the state. 
And what happened is, a long time ago, when the Americans came into the Great Lakes after the War of 1812, when Americans first start learning what's in the Great Lakes, Americans have no idea what's here. They have no idea about the people, the nations, the languages of the Great Lakes. And as they come in, we make agreements for, okay, the United States can move in a treaty. Yes, you can remain, and you can keep doing what you've been doing for thousands of years or hundreds of years or however long you've been in place and the way you sustain yourself. That's great. Awesome. Fast forward 140 years later, we've completely collectively forgotten those agreements with one another. And so the spear fishing conflict or the walleye war in Wisconsin is this great case study in misunderstanding and how easily it is to forget the agreements we make with one another, but how easily we can recapture the spirit of a shared future if we choose to. So I think Act 31 gives us a great sense of perspective, of thinking about this place and the many different ways we understand this place. Um, and that's a skill set that will be valuable for anyone wherever they go. In this global connected world of learning to work across culture, to see different perspectives on any one different decision we have to make collectively together, I think these are skills that are beneficial for all students to learn. So I think the motto that a lot of educators share is, if you understand why, you'll know how. In your own disciplines, because you're among the best, um, because you're committed to helping our students and helping our programs grow and develop, we think that if you understand why, um, you'll know how. And so this website is moving us toward what are the fundamental knowledges we need to know as we go forward. And so on our website, which will go live shortly, we just can hit the Get Started button, and it'll take us in a little further. So I'm not going to go through that video. But you'll notice in your handout, we're going to get to understand um, why in a second, that we have on the back of it some essential understandings. And we have these essential understandings because we noticed when I visited classrooms, when I worked with TAs and student teachers, that you know, 80 to 85 percent of the students um, in our programs have little to no knowledge of the American Indian nations in the Great Lakes. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we had this educational mandate that came out in 1989 that asked us to help students learn about the peoples of the Great Lakes. And so there's been a little disconnect about the students coming into our programs and their lack of knowledge about the American Indians of the Great Lakes, and the fact that our state has an educational mandate that asks teacher education programs, school districts, teachers, to inform and, and empower students to understand the, the shared history and the shared past they've had with the nations of the Great Lakes. So the statutory requirements are listed on the inside. It kind of tells us exactly what is expected um, through Act 31. Now, Act 31, I mentioned as a nickname, right, it's, it's actually the name of the, the biennial budget. We had Act 10, a controversial uh, state budget that was passed a couple years ago now, two or three years ago. So Act 31 was the 1989, uh, 1991 biennial budget. But we collectively use that Act 31 to refer to um, these educational mandates about learning about the federally recognized Indian nations in Wisconsin today. So. I just wanted to point out that we kind of have this kind of component here. Um, it mirrors the website itself. And I'll walk us through that in a second. But I want to go back to the why real quick. So has anybody heard of the walleye war before? Somebody mentioned it before. Has anybody, what do you guys know about the walleye war? It's controversial. Controversial. <laughs> The word war kind of implies something, right? I mean, <laughs> so something's going on. It's a bunch of spear fishing and walleye. Yeah. And, uh, people up north had a real problem with it because of the dangerousness and stuff that they had to abide by. It was just what you mentioned. I mean, I don't know the, the details of it, but I don't think anybody could agree with that. Right? Sure. So we heard uh, sport fishermen, some sort of contest, a worrying about a resource, and a conflict over that resource to some degree. Do you want to add anything to it? Oh, I saw another hand back here. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's a great story. Yeah. Wasn't it also a protest in a sense? Yeah, there were a lot of protests. No, I mean, wasn't the act of the spear fishing partially a protest? Um, because of uh, land issues or something? 
That's right. Yeah, we, we, we heard of the name, uh, the Tribble Brothers. So we have some Lacoudere Ojibwe members um, who go to college, and in one of their courses, they're asked to research uh, something, and they pick researching the treaties that their ancestors had signed with the government. And, our, and that little uh, pictograph we looked at earlier was reminding us of some of those negotiations and treaty making um, their ancestors had made. And so in researching the treaties, they realized that they, their ancestors had retained for them off-reservation hunting and fishing and ways of being. Um, and so this, the brothers decided to act upon it. They said, what's test to see how strong this treaty still is today? And they staged a fishing event, and they told the Department of Natural Resources that it would be fishing that day. And on a frozen lake, because uh, borders are so ephemeral, borders are so transparent on the land, and they seem to shift every now and then. The reservation borders were down the middle of a lake. And so you could fish on one side of the frozen lake if you were a tribal member, it would be on reservation fishing. But if you went across a certain point of the lake, you'd be in non-Indian uh, land status. You'd be in state land. So the brothers told the DNR they're going to go fish that day. They moved their little fishing operation just across this border, and the DNR showed up and gave them a citation. One of the brothers whipped out of his back pocket a copy of the treaty and said, no, no, I got permission. I can do this all day. You know, so you can't. Um, and the DNR said, I, literally said, I don't know anything about that, and gave him a citation. They called it the most famous citation in Wisconsin history in that it forced the state to kind of reconcile, okay, what agreements had we gone into with the Native nations of the Great Lakes previously, and how do we negotiate with the peoples who are still here and the ceded territories that they still live in? So if we look on this map, we can see Le Couture, right? That's right there. This is the ceded territories, these little dot lines, right? We can see the dates of the land sessions themselves, 1837. We talked earlier about the 1842 treaty. Um, we see an 1836 chunk up there. So in these lands, they retained the ways of being that they've done for a long period of time, despite not having title to the land status as they used to. And what happens is when the Voigt decision goes forward, there's a law case, right? LCO versus Voigt. Goes to a federal appeals court, and it rules in favor of the LCO. That is true, that, that they can, in fact, hunt, fish, and gather off reservation. That that is something that is a binding agreement. Backlash, right? People, Americans don't like unfair, right? Unfair just kind of rubs us the wrong way, right? If somebody's getting something special, I feel that might be unfair. So a lot of people misunderstood the nature of treaty making in these agreements and felt that the Ojibwe nations were getting something special. And that's not fair. And so there was a little pushback. So every red mark you see is the site of a violent conflict over spearfishing, over the fishing of Ojibwe off reservation. So we're talking a widespread conflict, right? And it's just a fundamental misunderstanding, right, that treaties, we make them all the time. Uh, 1960 something, 1969, I can't remember the exact date. The Chamasal Treaty um, between the United States and Mexico, right? The Rio Grande River shifted, and the border used to be the river, so now there's this kind of no person's land. Uh, you know, is it yours? Is it mine? Uh, we should renegotiate that treaty to whose boundaries are whose, right? Sovereign nations, right? So. The United States had engaged in this treaty making. People didn't understand the terms of those legal agreements, and they felt there was something special and unfair going on. So it became blockading and rocks and fights and just a really horrific scene in northern Wisconsin over the view that the Ojibwe shouldn't be allowed to do this, that it was unfair, that it was a possible threat to the resource itself of, of fish in the waters, and that it might hurt the economy in some way, shape, or form. It was all sorts of propaganda at the time. So it was really a difficult chapter in Wisconsin history. I got wind of it out in Washington, because I'm not from Wisconsin myself. I was in Seattle. And I remember seeing a documentary, Lighting the Seventh Fire. And there's an incredible banner over Main Street. I believe it's Monaco, Wisconsin. Um, a banner. It's a little classic Main Street USA, right? Banner going over it. And on that banner it says, kill an Indian, save a walleye. Right? 
And I'm like, I ain't ever going to Wisconsin. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it can't be safe for me there, right? I just can't do it. So, um, so I, just, I mentioned the nature of this widespread conflict, right? Because educational policies don't just drop out of, it, you know, out of the sky, right? They, we realize that we as a society need to understand one another, and we need to understand the shared history we've had and the agreements we've made with each other. Um, and so out of this incredible conflict comes Act 31, this educational policy, that will hopefully inform um, the youth and the future generations of Wisconsin about the Wisconsin Indian nations and their cultures, their histories, their languages. And so we can kind of see materials, um, treaty rights, pluralistic texts, human relations, right? We see all these components of Act 31 in the statutes that have come forward. I won't, I won't belabor them too much, but it's that why is so important. Um, and we see another issue arising in Wisconsin if you've paid attention to the news. Has anybody noticed anything in the news of late that's uh, yeah. yeah, what's up? Mining. Mining, that's right. An incredible new chapter is about to emerge of tension in the state over sovereignty and the, nation, the notion of uh, uh, environmental justice in many ways, right? Um, the, the wolf hunt? The wolf hunt, that is right, the wolf hunt. There's another issue playing itself out. Um, there's some night shining of deer for the Menominee Nation. Um, what else is there? There's something else going on, I, I can't remember. Up the pace. The gathering camps? Yeah, the, the anti-mining camps that LCO is organizing at this period of time. Yeah, right? in the ceded territory. That's right, in the ceded territory. So we can kind of see some previous mine. This is a great map by Professor Zoltan Grossman. It kind of encapsulates all these areas of tension that are, that are, that are always kind of be percolating in the state. We have some of the hunting and fishing issues. Uh, we have these mining, these resource assets of the state. And, um, yes, we want them, but they come with some cost, environmental cost. Um, and how are we going to negotiate that environmental cost as we go forward? Um, so Act 31 remains just as relevant um, today as it when it originated back um, in, a, in a pretty difficult time in Wisconsin's history. So any immediate questions about why Act 31? I think that's really the most important message I wanted to convey today is just, you know, we, we have these issues and we'll continue to have them if we don't understand the agreements we've made uh, in the state with the Wisconsin Indian Nations. And it, it's just good neighborhood policy to know your neighbors, um, the people who've been here for a long time. So, uh, oops. I want to, uh, there is a great resource here in that if you went into anywhere on this website, we have some lesson plans kind of mapped out for you. So, if we went into culture, we have some recommended readings. So, it will give some text that you might think about accessing or promoting. And there might be some, some lesson plans that uh, like we're really promote for those who need to engage in this material in some way, shape, or form, these particular texts. You know. So th they had a big book signing last night at the Wisconsin Historical Society for the second edition. This book is great. So this is basically the high school level, and this is your elementary school level. So these would be your low-hanging fruit, your easiest resources to share. And then importantly, if you can pass those back, one for each table. Yeah, thanks. These are some great lessons. So one, if one were interested in what kind of lessons could I share with students, here's your lesson plan book that goes along with these texts. And excitingly, it has a CD-ROM in it. Um, and in that CD-ROM, we can say, hey, there's these lessons that one could use um, should one want to address this subject matter. So I just wanted to promote and forward some really great resources that we highly encourage um, people who want to engage in Act 31. Here are some really well laid out lessons for one to use. And here I clicked on this video the way. So if there are these short streaming video clips, we have them embedded in the website. And this one took us to the ways. And there's this incredible new story that was just completed this summer. And just a warning, there's going to be the, uh, a little five minute video here and we'll wrap up. There's going to be a little cleaning of a deer. So if one is a little, uh, uh, finds it a little you know, challenging, just close your eyes. You'll, you'll see it coming up, right? So 
I, I, this video is so useful for today's talk because we talked about the ceded territories a little bit, hunting, fishing, and gathering, and ways of being. And here is a, a gentleman today still engaging in the ways of his ancestors. And this video kind of shows um, uh, how he's still carrying on tradition and, and how he's also illuminating a little bit of the differences that come with hunting and fishing um, as a, a Ojibwe member himself. Like, if you're a hunter, he's like, why isn't he wearing blaze orange? Like, slightly, that, that rule doesn't apply to him in, in, the, in what he's doing. So there's a little nuance if one were a hunter, you would know he's doing things a little differently. ceremonies we have talks we let the spirits in the forest know that our intentions are to go out there and harvest the wawashkishi. My name is Biskakwane. I am a hunter from Lac de Flamme. I hunt for the health of my family and I hunt for the health of my community. After the deer presents himself to us and gives us that shot, we ask for forgiveness for taking this life and we also speak of how it's going to benefit our, our loved ones and our family through the feasting and the usage of its hide and its weas, its meat. I don't think anybody likes to see uh, the spirit leaving, but then we remember that we're, we're Anishinaabe and this is what we do and this is how we live. And we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to be in that circle with that deer in his life. And when he's gone, when he leaves, we take all his organs out and we, we keep the ones we want, the heart, the liver, sometimes the kidney. But once those insides, his organs, everything are out, we make an offering. That moment right there when you drag that deer up out of the forest and bring it home to your people. That's my favorite part of the whole hunt, that little trail right there that you create from where, where he fell. To me, that's a very sacred time. When a person has the ability to hunt, part of that responsibility of hunting is sharing your harvest with the people. You get to hide, and then we get all the different cuts of meat and everyone else cuts a meat, somebody would like it. There's an elder that likes the neck. I have another friend of mine, he likes the ribs, you know. A lot of people love the tenderloins and the high quarters and the shoulders. We save the hoof sometimes. And so there's a lot to use on a deer. That venison, that wawashkishi weas, there's medicine in there. And all the stuff that we don't ingest today, all the natural things, the grasses and all the medicines that grow on the earth. Wawashkishi, he eats that. We eat him, and he gives that to us. So we want to spread that medicine to our community and our elders and give them that original food. Once the hide comes off the deer, the tanning process has begun. The hide can be used for many different applications tobacco pouches, moccasins. Those hides are very, very valuable to Ojibwe people and, and a lot of other native people. Say a baby's gonna be born, we make their first moccasins out of that buckskin that we just stand up. Or uh, a wedding's gonna happen, a gift is gonna be made out of that to represent that new life with their partner. I work out a lot with velvet and buckskin. When velvet was first introduced here in the 1700s, you know, it became a big part of our dress around Ojibwe territory, Anishinaabe territory. That represents a, a time when our art was at its most fantastic and glorious. That's when every family did it. And today there's only a handful of people left that do that.
when we first signed our treaties, there was land areas that we outlined saying, we'll share the land with you, but we're going to retain our hunting and fishing rights here forever. And I credit our ancestors for reserving that for us today. That role here as Ojibwe people, it's, it's, it's an important role. We're the keepers of that natural world. And so it's our job to maintain this traditional lifestyle for our families and for our reservation, for our elders and for our babies. Without it, you wouldn't know who we are, we wouldn't know where we come from. Yeah, so a pretty amazing uh, series has come out focusing on language. Uh, there's a Ho-Chunk language project underway. Um, I've I debated showing a video of uh, one of the undergrads on campus right now. He's featured in there. As he's a powwow dancer. Um, so it's just a great uh, tool one can use. I know professors who often show these videos five minutes before class. And they use it actually as a tool to get people in the seats early. Because um, people are like, hey, these are pretty compelling. Um, and so people use these videos often as an enticement to get students into the classroom before class even begins. Um, so we've made this resource to kind of outline and help people who are invested in Act 31 go forward. And so lesson plans are in here, recommended texts. If one were curious enough, on the right side we can see the 11 Indian nations. If you clicked on any one of them, let me see if it's uh, loading. We'll have to see if this one. Still got a little bit of bugs to work out. It's not loading up. But normally, um, when we click on these shields, it takes us directly to the tribal government websites themselves. So I gave you a brief overview of why. I didn't drill down too hard into the expectations we have of the different programs themselves. Obviously, teacher education programs, special education, secondary, elementary, are exceptional programs. But there's a little more obligation, maybe, within those programs to you than to other programs like rehab psych or counseling psych or um, art, kinesiology, physical education. Dan Tim, like I said, in our program is doing just incredible work. Um, just an amazing um, staff member, faculty associate on campus. So we, we kind of got some starting points, some essential understandings for those who just want to start getting a feel for the uh, different aspects of Native Nations today. And our website will mirror some of those resources for you to dig through. An event that's coming up down the road, another way to reconnect with Act 31 in the school is Caitlin Martins is here from uh, the School of Library and Information Sciences, where she's part of an incredible group called Tribal Libraries, Archives, and Museums, called TLAM. And we, the school, are so fortunate uh, that she will be a project assistant for Merit. Yeah, teaching, assistant at Merit. teaching assistant at Merit. Teaching. 322? Yeah. CNI 3, 3 And on November 4th, Native American Heritage Month, right? You know, good old Native American. So, uh, <laughs> we'll be in a merit library um, showcasing some more of the resources available to all of us in the School of Education. So, we hope you join us uh, down the road. And then November 7th, And all of this would not have come about were it not for the dean's assistance. And we've had some really powerful collaborators, uh, the Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Historical Society, um, and others. Um, as we get to, in the 21st century, really, hopefully, know intimately the neighbors of the, in, in the Great Lakes who have been in this place for some time. This is a great map that just shows the former ceded territories of the indigenous nations of the Great Lakes. And the dark red are the reservation or tribal land bases today. Um, so we can get a sense of who's been here in the Great Lakes and um, where they're at today in terms of land base. I'll turn it over to you. Does anybody have any questions going forward? I am here as a resource, as a teaching assistant who might be teaching uh, social studies or 
teaching about children's literature or other courses that have come in and, and helped with recommended readings, um, help uh, in the classroom itself. I've given landscape tours to a bunch of our teacher education programs as we kind of see the student body's relationship to the indigenous societies around them. So does anybody have any questions as we wrap up today here um, about Act 31 and our, all of us as a community effort forwarding Act 31 as we go forward? Questions, comments, concerns? Yes. What's, what's my last name again? <laughs> Bird Bear. We have a thing called the directory. Right? We can email me. Right? You can send me, you can call me, send me, send me a request. Uh, Dr. Lynn Posey Maddox has arranged for it for her class. I'm working with Shimon Schweber as we go forward this semester as well. So I work with some of the faculty and programs. Um, on the tour? Um, the tour has basically five stops. And we look at the actual buildings and architecture of our campus, and we can see very clearly the phases of American Indian history and the students' attitudes toward American Indian built in. So in the super micro font, right, because we're all 2015 vision up close, right? So we can kind of see the phases of Indian history down here. And as our buildings go up, they mirror almost directly uh, this nature of the relationship between the indigenous nations of this continent and the United States. And the students themselves express these same sentiments. So we go to the Union and we can see the pipe of peace, this incredible uh, cultural legacy that happened um, for almost 50 years on campus. It was the thing. It was like the Mifflin. It was like the Halloween. It was all these parties wrapped into one. It was the main student event for 50 years. Um, and it really reflects their kind of reconciling the indigenous presence around them in some way, shape, or form. Um, we then kind of walk ourselves through uh, the ethnic <laughs> cleansing period in Wisconsin. Eth there's a sincere ethnic cleansing effort for 40 years of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, whose ancestral land we're in right now. Um, we're talking $70 a head line item budget in the state government, right? Um, public referendum twice to ethnically cleanse the state. So it's, it's not a casual process. We're, we're talking a very difficult chapter. And the class of 1888 has left us an incredible gift on campus to remember that period of time of, of what happened here in the Great Lakes. And then we finish up as, as we have these great art, ancient earthworks on campus, effigy mounds. We go visit two effigy mounds. Um, that are located near the observatory here. And we kind of consider, okay, why did suddenly in the 20th century did we at least preserve and protect some of these items? Um, what was shifting in the nature of our relationship is, is we begin to think, hey, these are valuable for us. Like, there's something for us to learn from these um, monuments that were left behind um, that are 1,200 years old to 2,500 years old. So our, our tour kind of watches the journey of a university that goes, it's silently complicit in ethnic cleansing, and now we have this incredible shared future going forward. Um, and we see a powerful cultural object being created in concert with the native nations here in the state. So Dejo Residence Hall, named by the Ho-Chunk, has interpretive components examining this ancient landscape. So we see a, a distinct shift um, over the last 100 years of the nature of the relationship between students, the state, and the people of the Wisconsin Indian nations themselves. So does that summarize pretty well? The tour? A little longer than you wanted, probably. Um, so, what's that? Well, you ask by appointment. That's why I'm saying bird bear, right? You gotta email me. I do them by appointment only, right? So, like, I arrange them, right? So, right now, I'm trying to arrange nine different tours for the counseling psych 125 courses, right? Uh, Chadboard Residential College wants them, professors request them. So, I just do them by appointment. Um, because I don't advertise them. They, I give enough already that uh, they kind of have a word of mouth kind of component to it. So if any of you wanted to go on one as a group, we could arrange to do that. Does that make sense? Um, any other questions? On the same topic, do you do any for um, Madison Public Schools? I do. Believe it or not, I have a 20 minute version for fourth grade. <laughs> uh, so uh, I work with student teachers. And you know, the, the attention span of young learners, you know, I kind of have to make it a little shorter. Because the long, the walking and the, the, the amount of content, a little much. So we focus on uh, the oldest tree on campus. It's a 300 to 330 years old, which I remind everybody is old of the United States. It's a political idea, twice as old as the state. Um, so our tree is an incredible time machine between two distinct societies, the Ho-Chunk Nation and then us today. Um, so we, kinda, we look at that and we look at the effigy mounds and we have this great new artifact called the Tree of Peace. It's a living monument on campus 
planted in the heart of the spear fishing continent. So in a time where we are just in total unrest, the tree gives us a message of unity and strength. That when we're unified, we're strong. Uh, when we're in conflict, we're weak. And so how do we find unity among ourselves today? So there's a great little component we share with the students. So I do work with student teachers mostly um, as they want, they've taken a tour in, in their program and then they want to somehow use it in their own instruction as they go forward. My goal is to have them do it themselves. Right? But they're still a little nervous about it all, right? And so how do we get them to a point where they're confident and capable? Because they're so talented. Um, but it's moving everybody to confident and capable because um, you're among the best. I mean, you're, you're awesome. And so how do we get you to be confident and capable around the content of Act 31 itself? Right? And that's what I'm here for, to help. Okay, we have these great materials that get us started. We can have conversations. We can do some more research. We can look at the, some really vetted resources that most Indian educators in the state are forwarding today. So any other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, the, the tensions in the north have been heating up for a while. You know, my colleagues around the UW system have talked about the slowly eroding uh, relationships between Indians and non-Indians, that there's more and more tension um, happening in these communities again. And this is no joke, right? When I first came to work here, I'm not from the state, right? I promised myself I'd never move to Wisconsin after the banner, right? It's like, nah, I'm going. <laughs> um, and I remember I drive students from here to the reservations like Menominee or uh, Oneida. And I stopped one time in a university vehicle, a van with all of us, in a gas station in a town that I didn't know because I'm not from the state. And the student's like, we do not stop here. Like, this is not a safe place for us to stop. And I'm like, those are your issues. I'm not from the state. Giant university emblem on my car. I it must be a shield, right, to protect me. Um, I'm going to get a Diet Coke. So you, know, you can stay in the car, but I'm, I'm getting out. Um, so just remind that there is tension in the state, right? That, that there is still some racial animus that's out there. And it's ratcheting up again. So here we have the Ho-Chunk Nation. This is just a couple weeks, a week and a half ago. They took their flag to the mining cave. You'll see some flags in the background, right? So when does the United States plunk its flag down on the land? It's like, boom. When do we put uh, our, the national standard up? You know, wh how do we use the national standard to affirm or reaffirm uh, different positions we have as, as nations, right? So here we have indigenous nations. We have five nations in the state plunking down their standards, right? At a, at a place of contest, a place of conflict. So it's a pretty amazing thing happening right now in the state when you have unification of tribes in the state over an issue they feel is a threat to all of them in some way, shape, or form. Um, so here's the Ho-Chunk Nation putting their flag up at an anti-mining camp that the Lakuta Ojibwe are running. Hmm? Um, I'm not familiar, I'm not familiar with the mining issue. Do you have any good points on those mining camps? Yeah, the, tenth, the, the mining issue is we've always had these pretty incredible mineral assets in the state. To extract them comes at pretty great environmental cost. The Bad River Ojibwe in particular are in the downstream runoff below the mine. This mine is known to have an absolute 100% guarantee of environmental degradation. That pollution is a guarantee. The Ojibwe people's like, center of being, their purpose in life, is wild rice. This will 100% con contaminate wild rice beds. They cannot have their way of being threatened by environmental degradation. And they will go to the mats, as they say, or to, you know, in the godfather. I mean, they are going to put a full effort into protecting the wild rice, which is central to their way of being, their own worldview, their sense of self. So and I think that's the heart of the mining issue, is that this will 100% contaminate the environment in some way, shape, or form. And they can't have, being downstream of the mine itself, they can't have that environmental degradation come to them and ruin something that is so precious to who they are as a people. And I think that's the 10 cent version of it. And they're going to use the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, treaties, sovereignty, everything they have in their legal 
wallet, their legal toolkit, to help prevent that environmental degradation from happening. Yeah. Is there anybody else that have a comment on? Mining, iron. Yeah, this is an open pit mine, a giant hole in the ground. I think it's like, how wide is it? It's 20 miles long. Or something. So it's going to be just this giant open strip on the land, right? Um, so it's, you know, it's a contested thing. So I, I, the, we could go into a whole class on mining issues. But uh, <laughs> uh, what, it's just important for me to show the, the nature of unification over an issue that's going to be very tense. There's going to be a lot of propaganda, a lot of media. Um, and it's only going to kind of you know, work against some of those human relations and, and understanding one another expectations that Act 31 is asking us to do. Um, all right, so it is now noon. Bird bear <laughs> refers to another animal. Who can figure out what a bird bear is? Who's a good puzzler? Sagaga Nabitse in Hadatsa is bird bear. It remains another animal. An owl is not a bird or a bear. It has to be non-bird, non-bear. Any guesses what a bird bear might be? What do you got? A bat. That's right. So I'm the Batman. Right? So I've risen. It's my year. Uh, so uh, yeah, bird bear. I just use that as a name game with students so they remember me. Um, and that uh, if you ever want a, to support or help going forward, <laughs> You know how to find me, the Batman, Bird Bear. So thank you so much for your time and energy. And uh, thank you so much for bringing your excellence to our school.